Hi everyone, welcome to Do You Believe? Thanks so much for being here tonight. Um, I have an awesome guest tonight, but before we get to our guest, would you please subscribe to the channel and please give us a like? We'd really appreciate it. I am your host, Noreen, and in the studio with me, I have Tim Wood. Hello, Wave, everybody. Tim. Hello. <laughs> Nothing to see right now. Tim's Hello. with me tonight, and so you know what that means. That means after the show, we're going to be doing uh, an ITC session uh, with the Ghost Box, right, Tim? Yes. Right. Yes. And so tonight, I have an awesome guest. She's a dear friend of mine, Andrea Perone. I've had her on my show before, and I think our last show was lasted over two hours, but it won't be two hours tonight. She has an awesome haunted true story to tell you. And so let's all please give a warm welcome to my dear friend, Andrea Perone. She has written the book, House of Darkness, House of Light. Welcome, Andrea. Thanks so much for joining me tonight. Oh, thank you so much for having me. It's truly my pleasure to be with you. Thanks, Andrea. Now, do you want to tell the viewers um, about your book and what's happening with it? Well, I'm very proud, pleased, and thrilled beyond measure to announce that Volume 2 of the trilogy was published on March 11th, which, interestingly enough, turned out to be two years to the day that Volume 1 was released. Uh, and I had no control over the release date. I had done all my work, and it just happened to come out on the same day that the first book did two years prior. Um, volume 3 will not take that long. <laughs> It'll be out before the film is released in July. Uh, but it is a, a full accounting, uh, an unabridged chronicle of events which occurred with our family between uh, 1970 and 1980 in a beautiful colonial farmhouse in Harrisville, Rhode Island. And we lived there for almost exactly a decade. And in that course, over that course of time, we all were exposed to elements, supernatural elements that we uh, at first truly could not comprehend and then learned to live with and actually uh, develop an affinity to. And we were all little children. I was the eldest of five little girls. And I was 12 years old when we moved into the house and my baby sister April was five. Cindy, uh, number four, was seven or eight. Uh, I'll have to do the math on that. Um, and Christine was uh, 10 and Nancy was 11. And we were exposed to things that none of us had, well, not only had we never seen anything like what we saw in the house, but we had not ever experienced it. Uh, considering the supernatural. We were still so young, it wasn't even on the table. We didn't know what it was. Andrea, um, did you so know? Consequently, and as I'm sure you know, children are wide-eyed with wonder in the world. And so we were experiencing these apparitions and the goings-on in the farmhouse from an entirely different perspective than our parents did were. Your, did your parents know that the house, the, that the uh, farmhouse was haunted when they purchased it? Oh, God, no. Oh, my God, no. That was, it. like I said, it was not anything that anybody had even considered. It was just an old, beautiful farmhouse on 200 acres of pristine land. And it was the most beautiful place that any of us had ever seen. And my mother wanted it desperately so that she would have a clean, wholesome environment in which to raise her children. And that was the only impetus behind her decision to even go look at the farm in the first place. And she did so uh, quite on her own, having seen a small advertisement in a local paper when we still lived in Cumberland. Rhode Island, which is a suburb of Providence. Um, the three books chronicle the entire time that we're there, and they start while we're still in Cumberland, Rhode Island, because an entire series of events transpired there, which really became the catalyst, which prompted my mother to look for another place for her children. Uh, it took 
took about six months from the time she found the farm till we actually purchased it and moved in. And it was in the middle of a snowstorm, and as we were moving in, uh, actually the snowstorm had pretty much subsided by that time. We traveled in it, but it had, it had um, quelled a bit by the time we were unloading the truck, but it was still slippery and icy, and ugh, it was a mess. And we were carrying boxes into the house out of this enormous moving van. And I walked right past a man in the dining room who I thought was a man. And I found out later from my sisters, Cindy and Nancy, that it was something quite else. <laughs> that it was perfectly able to manifest in full form oh and then disappear. And my sister Nancy named him Manny because she was a little kid and he was a man. And so <laughs> before we knew it, the apparitions that we were seeing in the house were being named as if they were pets. <laughs> oh, how cute. How often uh, did these spirits manifest themselves Frequently. to you? Frequently. Frequently. On a daily they, basis? On a daily basis? At least 10, most likely 12. Oh, my God. Oh my God! Were, were these nice spirits? Mostly, mostly um, entirely benign, and would often manifest right in front of us, and yet not acknowledge us in any way, as though they were entirely in another space and time. Really? But the so... apparition was in full form. There was a, a father and a son who would uh, often appear at the top of my staircase where they'd both be standing with their dog looking out the back window of my bedroom. Oh my and God. so it, it was a bit unnerving. You know, my mother got used to hearing us cry out, Mom, there's a ghost in my room. You know, and but it was mostly because we didn't want to run through them. We didn't, you know, <laughs> I have a whole story in volume two about how these I call them the Holy Trinity, the Father, Son, and the Holy Dog. That are <laughs> at the top of my stairs, and there's a notebook on the other side of them that I need so that I can go back to school. <laughs> Could you do something? Else? And of course, by the time she got there, they had dissipated, and and which made me wonder, even as a child, is this. Um, is this like a, a hologram? Even before I knew what a hologram was, I mean, they didn't really, I don't know if that word even existed back then. I know there were no such thing as answering machines <laughs> or cell phones. Yeah, or, oh, yeah. Like, you know, it was uh, rather um, uh, primitive compared to how our lives are today. But uh, I would I would often say to her, it, it, was, it was more of a, a nuisance than anything else, but there was also something very evil and very dangerous in that house. And my sisters, I believe, inadvertently opened the door to it. How did they oh, do that? Well, uh, playing with the Ouija board. <gasps> no which way. They had been forbidden to do. And so when they, what happened when they would use the Ouija board then, Andrea? All hell broke loose in the house. Oh my God. Yeah, there was a, a massive manifestation in the middle bedroom upstairs, which happened to be directly above the bedroom where all the major manifestations occurred with my mother and father. It was what Lorraine Warren called the core, the energy core of the house. The master. And that was directly above a hand-dug well that was in our cellar. Um, we, over time, as my mother began to do the historical research around who these spirits were, because while well, my father was busy denying that they even existed, my mother was quite clear that they existed and wanted to know precisely who they were and did not for a moment think that they were just merely passing through. So how did, did, did you, were you able to find out who was haunting the house? Uh, yes. Uh, to a certain extent, we certainly were. Um, there were a number of, and, and interestingly, Noreen, I don't know if I've ever shared this with you before, but based on the history and based also on information that we've gotten from uh, Keech's History of Burlville and also from the Black Book of Burlville, we have discovered the names and the identities of most of the people that we believe are still to this day 
um, haunting that abode. And almost all of them died by their own hand, or they died so quickly and so tragically that they don't know they're dead. Oh my and that God. is my presumption. I know you didn't tell me that before. Wow. So how did your how did your mom find all this out? Did did you look at pictures? You were able to were you able to look at other pictures in these books and identify them then? Uh no, there were no pictures. It was just based on uh, uh finding their tombstones and getting etchings of the dates and then matching them up with the dates that were listed in the history books. There were really no photographs. We only have one photograph of the entire Arnold family, and this was the Arnold estate. It was at first the Dexter Richardson homestead when it was first built. It was finished in 1736. It later became known as the Arnold estate. And we have access to one photograph, which uh, you should be able to find on my somewhere out there. It's, I, I pretty much got it out there everywhere, but it's of... Um, the Arnold family in 1885, and it was taken three months before Bathsheba Sherman died, and she was one of the Arnold clan. Really? Okay. Bathsheba Sherman is the one who Mrs. Warren said uh, haunted our house and haunted my mother and hated my mother and lusted after my father. And she, if my father doesn't think that it's her, he thinks that it's Mrs. John Arnold who hung herself in the morning room in the eaves of the house, or he thinks it's the elder Mrs. John Arnold, who at the age of 93 hung herself in the barn. But Bathsheba Sherman is the one that's most suspect because she's the one that had the most sordid reputation in the village of Harrisville. When she was a young woman, she had in her care uh, an infant. Uh, we don't know if it was her own baby or if she was babysitting. But apparently what she did was, well, what she was accused of doing, let me put it that way. Okay. What Bathsheba was accused of doing is taking the needle and driving it into the pit of the skull of this infant. The baby had convulsions and died. And there was an inquest in the town of Chapachet because the town of Burrowville was not even incorporated at that time when this happened. And so the county seat was Chapachet to the south and there was an inquest and she was let off the hook because there was no forensic evidence there was no DNA back then and a la Lizzie Borton she talked her way out of it and convinced everyone of any import in her case that it was an accident and but the people of the town never forgot and she was Oh, treated uh, very harshly. Uh, it turned out that her judge and jury was the town folk themselves, and she was uh, she had a horrendous life. And the word was that she was a practicing witch, and that she had sacrificed the oh. infant to the devil for eternal youth and beauty. And I think that the way that all started was, keep in mind, it was not that much longer. Um, it was not that far past the Salem witch trials. Mm. Uh, and witchcraft was uh, very dark and forbidden and uh, truly a dangerous thing to accuse anyone of. So why do you think she ha was ha haunts the farmhouse? Uh, I think that her life was that if it is indeed Bathsheba, whoever it is, let me put it to you this way, whoever the woman is who haunts that farmhouse, who haunted my mother and taunted her with flames, with fire, whoever it is perceives herself to be the ongoing mistress of the house. She told my mother in no uncertain terms, get out. Now, did you hear these words in your, with your own ears? No, I heard these words through my mother under hypnosis. Oh. We'll drive ye out with fiery broom. Oh. We'll drive ye mad with death and gloom. Oh my God! And and chant and an incantation that my mother could only remember part of. 
until she was hypnotized and she has refused to ever undergo that procedure again. Oh she feels God. that the world knows enough about what was said to her and what happened. And there was a gathering in her bedroom with my father placed in some kind of state of suspended animation. She was absolutely unable to wake him during the siege. And it was that spirit along with every other spirit in the house from little children to elderly people all standing around my mother's bed at the same time with torches that were ablaze and my mother out of her mind in fear because all she knew was that there was fire in her house and her children were asleep above her head. Oh my God. Now these spirits never uh, appeared before your father? No, my father did have several uh, encounters, many encounters, but he was not allowed to see what, in your mind's eye, try to imagine what a coven of witches would look like, uh, all chanting the same time, all in unison. That's what happened to my mother. Now, my father, my mother was attacked two different times, uh, physically attacked. No, I'm sorry, three different times. Um, and then there were two major manifestations in her bedroom, both of which my father was present for. Uh, when he woke up, his back was serrated as if something that had sharp claws had literally torn the skin from him. Oh my God. And even then, even after it happened the first time, he was so stunned by it. It took years, Maureen, years for my father to come to terms with what happened at the farm. And it was his doubt about it and his staunchly pragmatic attitudes about it that created a rift between my parents that actually never healed. It was the beginning of the end of their marriage. Oh, it's too bad. Because my mother had never once lied to my father, and he questioned her um, veracity on the subject when she started seeing things and having, uh, literally being physically attacked. I mean, she was, she was, uh, she could have been killed twice. Once was an episode that occurred in the garden. It wasn't just the house. The barn was more active than the house. The property was as active as the house and the barn. Oh, so there were spirits uh, outside of the house as well. Yes, many, many. There were uh, a whole little troop of Indian children, uh, Nipmuc Indian children that played in the woods that my sister April, my sister Cindy saw frequently. Um, April, I think, saw them even more than Cindy did. Uh, I know that Nancy saw a family that lived in the house that later was torn down and was the old cellar hole on the property. And all of these stories are in um, Volume 2, including the one episode that my mother, thankfully, thank God, has no memory of. And that's the night that the Warrens came and did a seance in our house. Now, how did the Warrens get involved in this? Well, we're not exactly sure about that, honestly, because my mother never, my mother was so mortified by what was happening. The only person that, to my knowledge, she even told was our family attorney, because she wanted to know if she could get out of the sale of the house, mm -hmm. or at least turn around and put it right back on the market. And so she has shared with him and another close friend of hers, Kathy, um, but we're not exactly sure. Uh, we, we did have a friend who had gone to see the Warrens, um, but even before they came, just before they came, uh, Keith Johnson came to the house with his group, Pyro, from Rhode Island College. Well, how did they find out exactly about sure it? How they, oh. knew either. <laughs> they thought that my mother had called them, and my mother says, no, I didn't call anybody. So we're thinking that it was one of our friends who was trying to help because they were literally, you know, genuinely concerned for our welfare. So you um, were telling... By the way, Keith came to the house with his brother and a small uh, group um, of parapsychology researchers. And uh, Keith had a very <laughs> intense and interesting experience his first time. 
inside of the house. <laughs> and he's a very brave soul because he just keeps going back. You know, he's been back a couple of times with me and on his own and uh, has written about the, the story as well in uh, Paranormal Realities, his series of books as well. Interesting. And uh, then I believe, I'm not sure, but I think that uh, Keith or somebody in his group might have informed the warrants because Keith did come back to the house at one point. I can't remember if it was their second or their third visit, but he did come uh, with the warrants. And so they were associated some way. I'm not exactly sure of the details of that. It was a long time ago. It's hard to remember. Yeah. What I wrote about in the story was what in, in volume two was uh, what happened to Keith the day that he went upstairs with my sisters as they began a tour of the house. And my mom was still downstairs and she said, I'll be right behind you. She never even got a chance to come upstairs before the doors started slamming and windows started slamming and, and the kids were screaming and being hit in the head and Keith's eyes got as wide as saucers. Uh, it was, and what it was was his question that triggered it. He wanted to know why we didn't have a cross or a crucifix anywhere in the house. And when he asked that, all hell broke loose. Oh, my God. Now, Keith is a demonologist, or I don't know if he was at that time as well. Well, he was young. I was 15 when they came. And Keith was only four years older than oh, I was. He was oh, a college student. So there's, you know, not, not that much space between us. Whereas I believe the Warrens were probably in their late 30s. So, what did the, uh, what, so how many times did the Warrens come to the home? Uh, all told, I think about five or six during the course of their investigation. And uh, then my mother and father went out to their home in Connecticut because they were having a great deal of difficulty getting um, any taped interviews with us, with my parents or with us, the, our siblings, my siblings and myself. Uh, because every time they'd take photographs or try to tape something, they said that it all kept coming out blank or white noise. And it was as if the house was shutting them down electronically and not allowing, to, allowing them to record anything. So it took a trip to their house. And I do know that a very old recording of the interview with my mother took place. And I had the opportunity to listen to it one time several years ago, and honest to God, it did not sound like my mother. Oh, really? I, I saw, Noreen, I saw things happen in that house. My sister Cynthia saw things happen in that house that night during the seance that uh, altered our consciousness forever. Are you allowed to say what happened? <sighs> Is well, it in the, did they put that in the movie by any chance? Um, well, I'll be able to tell you that next Wednesday when I see it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm flying out to L.A. Oh. to uh, have a sneak peek, and I'm really thrilled and so grateful to Warner Brothers for, um, you know, just dragging me where I hit their center and yon uh, so that I can be involved with this process. Uh, it is, I, I, what I can tell you about The Conjuring is this. The Conjuring... I think that most people will perceive in the final analysis that The Conjuring is a, really an amalgamation of events and that it is really more meant to capture the spirit, as it were, you know, no pun intended, um, of the essence of the haunting that occurred in our house. My books are a total of 1,500 pages in three books. There is no way that anybody, no matter how good they are at their job, could cram that much information into a two-hour movie. It was meant to capture the essence of the haunting. And I, without even having seen the film, I know what a good job they did because I've met all the principals and I've been on the set while they were shooting and I know that James Wan is not only a brilliant director but he's a sensitive man who treated this material with the utmost respect and so did the executive producers and so did the actors. They could not have cast the film better than they did. Uh, I've only seen a two-minute trailer so far. It was extremely well done. I can't 
can't wait for the next one. And next week, I get a special screening of the film, and I'm so looking forward to it. Are they going to make a second movie out of this? You know, I don't know, and that's not really even something that... I, I don't even want to go there yet. I mean, I, I see... I have great visions for this, and I am going to let the universe allow this to unfold however it's supposed to. Right now, I'm still in reclusive writer mode because I'm working diligently to get Volume 3 just as beautiful and flawless as Volume 1 and Volume 2, and because I'm so neurotically attached to the text, it takes all of my energy and my concentration just to focus on that. Because I want the finished product to be a true rendering, almost as though painting a picture, taking my reader by the hand on this beautiful spiritual journey. And people look at me so cockeyed when I say things like that. But you know what? I wouldn't trade that 10 years of my life for anything in the world. I learned everything that I needed to know about life and death during that decade. And I've lived my entire life knowing that there is something beyond our mortal existence. Ergo, I have not lived with the fear of death that haunts so many people. We all have our own demons, you know that. We are psychologically very complicated beings. And there's so much to delve into, but we all know that in the wee hours of the night or when we have a particularly bad virus or we've just witnessed a horrendous accident on the interstate, we take a moment to reflect on our own mortality. And what this series of books does is tell a story that is so compelling that it requires a leap of faith to believe. But if you are able to make that leap of faith, that quantum leap takes you into a whole new area where you not only have accepted your own mortality, but you are now exploring your immortality. Yeah. Because every single one of us is a spirit having a human experience. Yeah. You know, I wonder if that... Do you think that's Keith calling on the other line? Oh, good. I mean, I, I don't know. I'm a, I mean, we're doing... All right, hold on, Angie, just in case. But I don't know what I'm going to do with them if it is. <laughs> What am I going to do with him if it I'm is? Call myself. All right. I'll talk to him. All right. <laughs> All right. Hold on. Hold on for a minute. Hello? 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 Is this um, Maureen? Oh, don't tell me this is Keith Johnson. This is Keith Johnson. Oh, my God. Okay, I've, we're doing our show. We're live right now, and I've got Andrea on the other line. Tim, can you call Keith? Uh, yeah, here. Just, okay, uh, here. All right. Okay. Oh, give him your phone number? Yeah, just that's to give him. That's 650 oh, okay. okay. Uh, sorry, guys. Oh, Keith, here. Um, talk to Tim. It's on, it's on speaker. Hi, Keith. Uh, you can call me at 650 5 okay. Great. Uh, seven, three. Two, nine, seven, three. Yeah. Okay. Okay. All right. So I'm gonna hang up with you and get back with Andrew and then call Tim. Okay. Okay. We'll do. Oh, thanks, Keith. <laughs> okay. Bye. Bye. Andrea. Andrea. Yeah. That's Keith. <laughs> <laughs> Alright, he's gonna call um he's gonna call Tim's cell phone right now, so we'll get Keith on the uh Tim um he should be able to pick it up off of this one um Oh that's marvelous. I'm so delighted. Oh. He's the most wonderful human being. Honest to God, there are very few people that you meet in life that are that pure of heart. You know what I mean? I know. Um I wish I had known. <laughs> but he didn't. Okay, so we're, while we're waiting for Keith to call... Um, hey, Andrew, I have a question real quick. Um, how, you know, how did the people in the surrounding... Did the people in the area that lived around you in the town and stuff, were they aware of the things that you guys were going through at the house? 
Well, we started talking, as children do, about the things that were happening in our home. But we learned very quickly that that was not a good idea. Um, think back 30 years ago, 35, 40 years ago, supernatural activity was not, you know, the, the uh, it was a taboo subject. In some circles, it still is. Uh, so we learned quickly that this wasn't something that we could share with everyone, no matter how fascinating we found it or no matter how scared we were. It's interesting, one of my sister's uh, friends that she grew up with in her homeroom just wrote to me the other day and she said, I always wondered why Nancy was so tired, why Nancy always looked, she was such a sweet girl, but she always looked so tired. She said, I had no idea what your lives were like at night in that house. Wow. You know, Did it was, uh, yeah, we all, we, we were all affected in a variety of ways. And things would happen, and then we'd have to go to school and, and pretend that we were normal kids, when in fact, we were paranormal kids. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Do what's, you... what's the attitude of the town now with the property? Harrisville slash Burrowville could not be more supportive. Mm -hmm. uh, people have come out of the woodwork. I've had, I've reconnected with people I haven't spoken with in decades and decades who said, I sat next to you on bus number 10 and I heard you telling your friend Oscar about what happened to you that night in your bedroom and she's, and she's like, oh my God, oh my God. And then I read volume one and there's the story. <laughs> and I, it's happened uh, two, three hundred times. Yeah, people in Burrowville and particularly in Harrisville have been so incredibly embracing of this. And, you know, we were bullied a little bit in school, and we've even had people reach out to us and say, we're so sorry, so sorry I mistreated you or made fun of you. You know, so a healing has occurred as well. And that, to me, is the most splendid part of all, because... In the telling of our story, we waited 30 years to tell our tale of darkness and light. And we did so with purpose and reason because the world was not ready for this story when it actually happened. Now, now have you had any experiences since you moved out of the house? Yeah. That I've been, it's like stuff that you believed followed you around or uh, from the house? I really don't know how to answer that exactly. I don't really perceive it as a case of having been followed. Although my mother had a very intense experience when we moved to Georgia in 1980, which, which would lead uh, an experienced um, paranormal expert to perhaps claim otherwise that we had been followed. Um, however, but you have to wait till volume three for that story. Um, but I have, uh, Ever since I was um, first exposed to and came to terms with the entities, the spirits, the ghosts, the, the life forms that continued on in that house, we, I perceived it as shared space. We all did. All the children did. We shared our home. And I, 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 oh, I don't know if it's them. <laughs> that is such a protective influence, that is such a guiding force behind the writing of this book. But I will tell you that in my acknowledgments at the end of volume three, I thank the spirits because this volume, these volumes of books, this story, without a great deal of help from mortals and immortals alike would not exist. Okay, we've got we've got Keith on the phone. Wonderful. Keith, hi Keith. Hello, how are you doing? Oh, I'm just fine. Thank you so much for joining Andrea and myself and Tim Wood on the show. And Keith, um uh, everyone, this is Keith Johnson who is on the phone. He's the famous demonologist. You've seen him on Ghost Hunters and uh, is Ghost Hunters International as well, Keith? Were you on that? 
No, I was just I was on Ghost Hunters and I've been on Paranormal State as well. And um, can you just give them a little bit of background before we ask you about your experiences at the uh, Arnold uh, Estate? Well, I've been um, practicing as a demonologist for quite a few years now. I've been uh, paranormal investigating for even longer, and I've been doing it since I was a teenager and had many experiences and was a member of the Atlantic Paranormal Society long before the TV show Ghost Hunters even came out and uh, belonged to quite a few groups over the years. And I was into it when it was not popular. Before it was considered cool, I was into it. So uh, I've been doing it for quite a few years. Um, Andrea's here with us as well. Say hi to Keith, Andrea. Uh, he, I, I was just on the phone with him the other night. Hi. <laughs> We burn up the wires. We certainly do. Um, he's like a brother to me. He's a wonderful human being. I'm so thrilled that you made it, Keith. I'm thrilled that you're on with us tonight. Well, I'm, I'm glad to be here. It's, you know, it's always a pleasure to talk with you, Andrea. It always is. Keith, can you tell us what happened at the uh, Perone family's uh, farm? And how you got involved? How did you get involved in it? Well, I got involved by... Um, I was in a college parapsychology group at the time called Pyro Parapsychology Investigation and Research Organization. And um, I had put an ad in a local paper, actually. And uh, see, this is before most people even, you know, did anything like this. So I put an ad that we do investigations, and uh, that's how we got in touch with Andrea's family. And we were invited to come over, and we did an investigation, and we found out that this was the real deal. I mean, um, these people were going through a lot. They were going through uh, really something really horrendous, and the, the strain was very much showing on the family. And uh, we came in there. As soon as we came on the property and we went into that barn, it was just like the atmosphere was so thick. You cut it with a knife, and... It's hard to describe unless you've actually experienced it. It's actually like a an electrical charge, but it's draining from you. It's like a, there's there's too much static electricity in the air, and it's draining from you. And the more we talked about the subject, the thicker it got, as if something was responding and actually warning us. So as soon as we got on the property, we knew this this was actually going on. And uh, of course, an elderly woman has hanged herself in that barn an elderly woman who was uh, accused of practicing witchcraft uh, over a century before. So I was with the family, and the atmosphere just kept getting thicker and thicker. I was upstairs with uh, some of Andrea's sisters, and they were telling me how frightened they were. While they were telling me, I asked them, well, what, do you have any religious beliefs? They said, yes, we're a Catholic. So I I advised them, try calling, when you're frightened, try calling upon the name of Jesus. As soon as I said that, just, it, was, it happened so fast, all pandemonium started in the room. I mean, windows slamming, and uh, one of the sisters was slapped on the side of the head, she screamed in terror, and the atmosphere was like you could hardly breathe. You wanted to run right out of the room. That's how electrically charged it was, and it was draining right from you, almost like nauseating, like you couldn't stay in there anymore. And uh, I realized this was a very, very real situation that these people were going through. Oh, my God. How many times did you go to the home? Well, I've been there. Um, back then, I went, to, I went once to visit with the family and investigate. And years later, of course, I've been back since. And uh, always come away with something there. Every time I've gone there, there's some time, kind of experience. But I'll tell you, the way it is now is, is nothing compared to what these people were going through, Andrea and her family, because then it was really hostile and it was actively seeking them out, see? Mm -hmm. Now it's, uh, it's there. The presence is still there, but it tolerates the owners that are there. They're very, uh, very nice people, and uh, it just tolerates them. But something about Andrea and her family... <laughs> well, that's one way of phrasing it, sure. <laughs> well, there was just something that these this entity, these entities, especially one in particular, they wanted to consume this family. There's this hostile entity that I swear wanted to consume 
Andrea and her family. They just wanted to take over and just, just possess them in, in any way conceivable. Mm-hmm. And I do mean any way conceivable. Did, did, you, uh, did you do a, a paranormal investigation then on the home? And did 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 you get any pictures or EVPs? I did get several uh, EVPs, yes. And and I wish I had them right with me. And I've been looking all over trying to find them. And you know what happens when you're trying to play up, and it's all of a sudden uh, it'll kind of explode on you. You know, I I've, I've already had one take bite the dust so far tonight. One one take. So uh, I do have backup somewhere. I haven't been able to locate it, but. Uh, you know, what did it say, playing. Keith? You remember exactly? You gave me a copy of one, and I remember distinctly hearing two words uh, yes. on the tape, and that it was the time you told me that you felt like you were being uh, followed around by a little girl, or maybe that was Julie Griffin, who was when she was investigating, but I remember somebody telling me recently that um, Keith went with his crew and did a, a beautiful job um, photographing uh, actually videographing, uh, what's the word? They made a video which is on his um, on his Ghosts Are Near, I think it's episode 79, uh, which gives you a, a virtual tour of the house. And wasn't it that night, honey, that you got something that um, said, why are you here, or something like that? Well, that night we were talking about, we did a um, full EVP session and did get, we get no response from the questions and answers. However, after we've done the walk through the house and videotaped the whole thing, and uh, I, I really want to just a little boast about my team a little bit because they, they do such a wonderful job with recordings and videography and um, with the way they documented that house. Now, um, my team member Janine just went through that, that whole house top to bottom and uh, you know, it's, it's such a it's such a tour of the house, the way the house actually is. And uh, we were downstairs talking with Norma, who is the current owner, and she asked me if there'd ever been um, an exorcism performed there, or um, a blessing of the house. And I told her there had been clergy there, but they were not they were not able to totally get rid of whatever was there. When I they weren't the able to get rid of anything that was there. In fact, one priest came, who we think came directly from the Vatican, through my uncle Gene, who was a brother of the Sacred Heart in the Vatican. My mother told him what was happening in our house during one of his trips to the United States from Rome. And a few weeks later, a priest came to the house, and I mean, this was a holy man. He glowed, and he asked my mother if he could come into the house, and he walked through every single room. And just before he left, he said, I'm so sorry, Mrs. Perrin, this house cannot be cleansed. Okay. And he blessed the house from outside the house. Oh, my God. Keith, I have a quick but question. told your mother that it could not be totally it could not be cleansed. Keith, I have a quick question for you. Since you're in demonology, is there some locations that cannot just be cleansed through the power of God? Or, I mean, how... Why is that? It, Once in a while, you'll find, you'll find a house that the hold, is, the hold on it is so tenacious that, that the spirits, they'll just be so stubborn. Some, some houses, um, they just, they don't, they're out of the way they are. And for whatever reason, it's a mystery, but uh, certain spirits have a right to be there. They have a legal, spiritual right. We don't know why. Sometimes it's because they've been invited in. Um, but sometimes they just have a tenacious, tenacious hold on houses. Now, I believe through the power of God, people can be kept safe. People can be kept totally safe. If they are faithful, they are believers. But there are some locations and some houses, they're just going to keep coming right back. They're going to come, these spirits are going to, they're very malignant, they're going to keep coming right back. And I do believe the Harrisville farmhouse is one of those houses. Because I always did, describe it as a portal cleverly disguised as a farmhouse. Well, that's exactly what it is. I think it's a portal to uh, the spirit world. I think it's a portal to other dimensions as well. And um, I think it's even a, a time portal myself. Mm-hmm. I do too. In fact, well, the very best review that I have gotten uh, from my telling of this story, uh, House of Darkness, House of Light, was from a quantum physicist 
who read, uh, I gave him the entire manuscript, and he said, uh, when he wrote back to me, he wrote me one line, and I thought, well, you know, one line, what, <laughs> what kind of review is this? Well, the line was, your story is a masterpiece. It is also empirical evidence of the existence of a fourth dimension. Oh, my God. Wow. Verbatim. Oh, my God. God. So, so, Andrea, how did you come to terms with, like, all this activity? Like, how did you guys live with it? Was it every, every day something was happening, or how persistent was it? No, we'd actually go sometimes weeks and months without having a major manifestation. Uh, but little things would always happen all the time, and we, we felt very scrutinized, all five of us, the kids. Uh, we would never, there was one very large bathroom in the house, and uh, whenever anybody needed to go to the bathroom, she'd grab a sister to bring with her because we never felt that we had any privacy. Um, and so there was somebody always on guard uh, on our behalf. We learned to travel in a pack because things would happen less frequently if we were together in a group of three to five than if we were um, in, on our own as an individual is when we would sometimes be approached. So, and the problem was is that when that would happen, and Keith is very well aware of this, um, sensation of being what my sister Cindy calls being in the bubble, where you are having an encounter with a spiritual entity, but you cannot scream for help, you cannot yell, even if you do, no one can hear you, it doesn't matter if they're standing 10 feet away from you, they cannot hear you scream, and that's what Cindy calls being in the bubble, and that happened to all of us on a very frequent basis. Mm. Yeah, yeah, that's exactly what Andrea is describing. It is very much like a bubble. It's where you you are enveloped in kind of, I would call it a psychic cocoon. You're in a cocoon. Yes, yeah, yeah. um, with, with Time and the outside world just stops. You're contained in that space, and you cannot communicate, and you cannot get out of it. Uh, so it can be a very, very frightening it can last very briefly, but it can also be a very, very frightening experience while it's happening. Now, Keith, the new owners, you said you've been over there since uh, the new owners are, are, have moved into that uh, farmhouse? Well, they've been there for 25 years, Maureen. Oh, 25 years. Yeah. Oh, my God. I'm afraid to write. The next book that I write will be their story of what's happened to them in the house over the last quarter century. Oh my now, do we have any information about the previous owners? Uh, Andrea or Keith? There were several families that came and went very, very fast mm -hmm. out of the house prior to Norma purchasing the home. And so it was uh, the people that bought it from us uh, in 1980 uh, were only, I think, were only there maybe a matter of weeks. And the contractor that they had to come in to start the restoration on it to make it, you know, more colonial, more to its natural self. Uh, the neighbor said he left screaming like a maniac with the clothes on his back, left his car, left his tools, left everything behind. He had moved into the house to begin restoration on the house, and he went screaming down Round Top Road, and no one ever knew what he saw, and no one ever figured out what happened to him, but it, whatever it was, it, it made him wild, and he just walked away and never went back. Oh, my God. So were you guys ever afraid in the house? Uh, uh, well, <laughs> I would say the grand answer to that is yes. Um, however, I, I think that I was the one that was least affected in terms of the fear factor. I always found myself more um, the observer than anything else. And I knew from a very young age that it was imperative that I watch everything, that I record everything that was going on, because by the time I was 14 or 15, I knew I'd be the one that eventually told our story, but I knew that it wouldn't happen for a very long time, and it turned out to be exactly the case. Uh, did you, do you think these spirits that you had so many in the house, do you think that they were aware of each other? Oh, absolutely. Do you think they knew they were dead? Um... Not necessarily. At least there, I think there were at least a couple who died so quickly, including little Prudence Arnold. Bless her heart, she was only, she was a 
couple of months away from her 12th birthday. And she was raped and murdered in the house and had her throat cut by a scoundrel named Bill Norton who then ran from the house with the two dollars that he stole from her after he was done mutilating her. Mm -hmm. And he used the same uh, blade to cut his own throat about two miles away from the farm. Oh my God. Now, did you did you girls ever try to sit down and and try to commu actually communicate with them and talk yes, to that them? Yeah, was a disaster. Thanks for asking. Yeah, disaster. Oh my God. Yeah, twice. Cindy and her friend Lori, and then um, Nancy and Katie and Cindy started playing with the Ouija board that they were forbidden to bring into the house. You know, I don't know. I don't know if I've ever even discussed this with Keith, but um, I consider Ouija boards to be very dangerous, not for the paper and plastic that they're made out of, certainly. That's an inanimate object. But when you focus that kind of psychic energy and you have more than one person all thinking the same thing at the same time and calling forth the spirits, be careful what you ask for, for surely you will get it. Yeah. You know, one of my chapters with children are stupid. Kids are stupid. We were all told, my sisters were told not to bring anything like that into the house. Nothing associated with the dark arts. Mrs. Warren could not have been more clear. And they did it anyway. Wow. So they got what they deserved. Well, okay, so you guys were afraid. But why do you think you were so attached to the house when you were afraid of these spirits? Well, I don't know. I can't really explain that. But from the moment we all laid eyes on the place, we knew it. We knew it as though we'd lived there a hundred times. And there were spirits in that house. There were two spirits in that house that so closely resembled me that it was shocking to my family. Shocking. Uh, a little girl that w would walk through uh, the middle bedroom, come out of the eaves, through the closed door, walk right through the door, and walk through the bedroom. She always had a book in her hands. And my sister Cindy said to me over and over again, oh, my God, she looks just like you, just like you. And But I, I was five years older than Cindy, so the only way Cindy knew me at five years of age was from family photographs. But she still identified that little girl as me. Wow. No. And then I had an encounter with a very old woman in the house who had my identical facial uh, features, identical Oh my! Like looking in a mirror. Do you think there's some kind of connection way, way back? Yes, I do, at least for myself. But my mother was really the one that was under siege in the house. And she was the one that took the brunt of it. Um, Cindy had many, many episodes, many encounters. Uh, Christine had some that were so difficult for her to talk to that I was wrapping up the manuscript for the three books before I got her to tell me everything that happened to her in oh, that house. So were her experiences different from, your, from the other girls? Oh yeah, every one of us had very unique experiences. Very unique experiences with this were different entities. Oh, that's what I was going to ask you. Were they different? The, so with different entities, really, are you able to talk about those experiences? Well, honey, you don't have enough time. For oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I know. I told you only an hour tonight. You need to work out a good six hours for the show and then break it up into six segments because don't even get me going. I, 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 have, I have a quick question. Do you think, you know, that you're when you guys first arrived at the house, all experiences that you had, do you think it was somewhat a fate that you guys were somehow supposed to go there so that, you know, Keith and the Warrens and all, and then the Conjuring movie and all this stuff, so that the story of these possible entities that resided at this location, their stories could, could possibly be told? Do you that think is probably the most erudite, most brilliant question that has ever been asked of me. And speaking only for myself personally, I will say the answer is yes. That it was my destiny to tell this story, that I have lived in that house before, and that in telling the tale, the true, honest, 
history of that house and our experiences in it, I believe and I hope that it frees me to move on so that I don't ever have to spend another lifetime attached to that house. Wow. And my, if I may, my personal opinion is that uh, Andrea was prepped for this experience from the day she was born. Oh, wow. You know, Keith... Um, we had asked this question of Andrea the last time. I th Andrea, you know, it's about two years since you were on the show last time with me. But do you remember us asking you if you had any kind of UFO experiences on the property? Uh, yes, and I remember distinctly dodging that as if it were a bullet. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yes, uh, we, I did have, we did have some um, experiences at the house that were inexplicable outside. We saw things overhead. We, we, there, I don't know what the connection is. People ask me, I can't give you an answer. I would love to be the world's leading authority on this, but the fact of the matter is, no one is the world's leading authority on this. There's evidence that is being gathered, one video clip, one film clip, one photograph at a time, and one of these days, the human race is going to put all of this together, and maybe then it will make some sense. But I do believe that there is something beyond us that is beyond our ability to extrapolate or to comprehend. And that all we can do is honestly and authentically tell our experiences, not just ours as a family, but everyone. I've had so many people write to me and say, oh my God, I just finished volume one for the first time in my life. I know I'm not alone. It is very touching. And I have to tell you, if this story, if this true memoir helps people that have had their own experiences, then it will have been worth all the sacrifice to tell this tale and to put ourselves out in the world to endure the scrutiny that will inevitably come around this. You know, this is going to be a very controversial film. It's going to be a very controversial series of books. And, you know, not everybody's going to just hop on that pony. And so it, it makes us susceptible to criticism that we all got to the point, let me put it to you this way, we all got to the point where we just don't care anymore. We're all at an age now where it just doesn't matter. The people who matter in our lives believe us and have known about this for a very long time. Wow. Well, and I think that some people will, yes, there will be criticism because of this story being told, but also I think more importantly, people who have been through this will realize they are not alone and they have somebody to turn to and they will read this book and say, you know what, I'm, I'm not crazy, this is true, and I'm reading from somebody who understands exactly where I'm coming from. And I think this will be a godsend for so many people who have been through these kind of experiences. Andrea's already gotten a lot of response from this, from people saying, I read your book, I know what you're talking about, thank you for understanding. Wow, that's so awesome. Well, I think our time has run out. Um, Andrea, hold on for one second. Keith, thank sure. you. Thank you so thank much. You. It was just a pleasure to have you join us on the show. Would you like to plug anything or give us a website or anything oh, to the do viewers? That, Keith, do it. Well, my website is nearparanormal.com, N-E-A-R, paranormal.com, and uh, we have our own talk show which is ghosts are near we have uh, the links to our shows right on the site and uh, please tune into our shows you will see inside you will see the episode that andrea mentioned and uh, you'll see inside the house get a look inside the actual house of darkness house of light and you'll also see our interview with andrea which uh, was a very very special show and uh, so i advise anybody interested in this story tune into our site as well and You'll find us there. Oh, yeah, I will. I, I, I definitely will. And I'm asking you, Keith, would you uh, like to be a guest on our show in the future? I most certainly would. I, I most certainly would. 
Wow, thank you so much. Hold on, Andrea. Thank you, Keith. I'm going to say good night to you, and I will check out your website. I do want to see that interview, and I'd love to see the video on the house. I, I've been dying to see that. And uh, again, thank you so much, Keith, and have a wonderful evening. You're welcome. God bless. Same to good you. Good night, honey. I'll talk to you soon. Good night, Andrea. Good night, Keith. Good night, Keith. Do I just hit end? Yeah. Okay. Oh, he's such a wonderful human being. I just love that man. <laughs> you too. And his wife, Sandra. Oh, bless her heart. And oh, Andrea, thank you, my dear friend. Thank you so much for being a guest on tonight. And, and I, I just love hearing your story. And I love hearing you talk. Um, uh, good luck to you. Now, you said you were going to say something on my show. Uh, yes, well, I did mention that I'm going out to California to see the film next week. And um, while I'm out there, I'll be making a special appearance uh, with uh, Warner Brothers uh, around the film at the WonderCon in Anaheim. That's so awesome. I know. I'm really looking forward to it. And uh, we'll be speaking on a panel with Mrs. Warren as well. Oh, and that will be the first time in, I think, 36 years since oh. I've seen her. Oh, my so God. That would be delightful. I'm really looking forward to it. My sister Cindy's coming with me, and we're going to have a four-day jaunt through L.A. It'll be great fun. And when does your next book come out? Uh, the second book came out about a week and a half ago, okay. and the third one will be out probably no later than the end of June because I want it out before the film premieres in July. That's awesome. I can't wait to see the movie. Andrea, um, now... You are you? Do you have a website? I do. Uh, it's House of Darkness, House of Light .com, and I also want to invite everyone out there that's listening to hop onto my um, Andrea Perrin YouTube, and uh, it's got it's loaded with wonderful videos that we've made over the years about the story, which will show you many of your vintage photographs of the house and different interviews I've done, and it's it's a great channel. And Margie Marsky, who is my administrator, keeps it very clean and tidy and very easy to search. Uh, and also, I want to invite everybody to follow me on Facebook. I have my personal page under my own name, and then also the House of Darkness, House of Light author page, which will keep everyone up to date daily on what's happening around the books and the film. Awesome. Andrea, dear, thank you so much. Uh, it's just a pleasure having you again, and I'll, I'll uh, communicate with you on Facebook. Don't oh, be absolutely. a stranger. <laughs> Thank you so oh, much, Noreen. Thank, thank you. you very much to both of you. It's been absolutely delightful. Thank, thank you, dear. You. Thank you. Good night. Have a wonderful evening. Thank you. You too. Good night. Good night. I just love her. Oh, well, I hope you enjoyed the show. And please, everyone, please subscribe and give us a like. We'd really appreciate that. And let's see. Um, Saturday. I have a show on Saturday. Tim won't be with me, but um, I have a guest, um, Josh Hancock. He is a professor, a professor, an English teacher professor, and he did a documentary on called Cabin 28. It's the Ketty Resort murders. It is absolutely horrific. It's never been solved. And um, so he's going to be a guest of mine on the show. It'll be a uh, 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 intriguing show. Uh, it, the, it's a subject I, 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 I've been involved in this subject for like f I think five years now. I found out about it and, I, and it's just unbelievable. So don't forget Saturday um, and also don't forget subscribe to us, give us a like and uh, anything else Tim? Oh, uh, We only have eight tickets left for the uh, Virginia City uh, Paranormal Retreat so if uh, anybody's interested in coming out to Virginia City, we don't have any of the overnight tickets available, just the uh, investigation tickets, only eight left. So if anybody's interested in hanging out uh, in August in Virginia City, uh, it's going to be a great time. Mm -hmm. so, We're going to have yeah, fun. I yeah. can't wait. So, and then um, we're going to take a break. We're going to take a break and then we're going to be doing some uh, a live uh, ITC broadcast. We're going to be just kind of messing around with some new equipment and stuff. So, uh Stay tuned. Uh, please refresh the page too in about 20 minutes and a new player will show up. 
Okay. So thanks, everybody. See you in about 20 minutes. Uh, thanks to the uh, viewers, everybody in chat, and thanks to the moderators. Thank you so much. We'll see you in 20 minutes. Good night. Thanks, guys.